Epistemological Relativism Epistemology is one of the main branches in philosophy. It is the study of knowledge itself. And epistemological relativism? Well, it could mean many different things, but for the most part is the position that there is not one universal way of assessing a knowledge claim, regardless of context. It denies one way of justifying or acquiring true beliefs. That there could be many ways which would result in there being possibly many radically different or alternative knowledge beliefs, even, or at least seemingly, contradictory ones. And there could be different positions under the header of epistemological relativism that vary in strength as in how much relativism you can have. While there's much combat about that among different philosophers, at the lowest level hardly anyone rejects relativity when it comes to perceptual knowledge. As in knowledge based on your perceptual location. Like at any given time, say, the knowledge of how this particular side of the face of this rock appears to you is relative to your position to that rock. Or maybe how different people know different things because they are in different locations. Relativism at that level is perfectly fine, even with the absolutist position which is the opposite of the relativist. The real combat comes about when you're talking about relativism on a higher level, like natural laws of the universe itself, or math, or geometry, or even logic. Now back in the old days, those who used relativism as a weapon at even those higher levels were called skeptics. They used it to deny objectivity, and by that also claims to knowledge. Because for them, thinking that you could believe another set of beliefs even about these things means that you don't really know. Such as the ancient Pyronian skeptics. But the modern use of relativism up here includes philosophers who think that they can actually have relativism while not denying knowledge. Being a relativist, but not a skeptic. In a sense, saying knowledge doesn't have to be objective. That it can be relative. <laughs> Today we're covering this topic as it is presented in the middle chapter by philosopher Paul O'Grady, and that's the citation in the corner. So I won't be covering all of epistemology, which is virtually impossible to do in one video, it will be more of a surface covering of this major branch of philosophy which can still be a great source for someone to understand the kind of things going on in epistemology in a more general sense. But the conversation is going to be framed in terms of how different knowledge can be, or how relative things can get in epistemology, as discussed by Paul O'Grady, whose book I've chosen to present here, even though certainly some of these debates have continued past the time of his book being published. So you don't have to watch anything else if you don't want to, even though I may be suggesting other videos at times in this one, just take it more of a signpost. It will still be a great standalone video for someone new to generally grasp the kind of issues going on here, even if you're not interested in relativism or whoever this philosopher is. But if you will allow me to give some background first, uh, before we start talking about epistemology. Paul O'Grady is a philosopher who investigated relativism in many different cognitive areas. And I mean cognitive because he doesn't want to talk about merely morals, you know, like what's right and wrong, or aesthetics, like what counts as beautiful. Those things can be relative to different people or cultures, or not, who knows, we're not talking about that though. Our concerns here are about if even things like truth or logic or today, if knowledge can be relative too. And before you think that you have a very clear and obvious answer, please go watch this video I made on his first chapter. It will in some sense convey the power of this weapon. But O'Grady does then go on to battle in these two areas specifically against relativization. And those are what I call the limits of this weapon. And that's what I was really interested in. That's what I even came here for. I didn't want to have to cover everything in his book. So I already covered his first powerful and awesome battle on the front of truth. And also covered the kind of intricacies of logic. Since he did utilize the principle of logic in order to battle against relativization on the front of truth. But after that, I just wanted to go straight to his next battle where he defends against relativization. So if you're interested, please do go check out these first battles if you'd like. They are pretty good and certainly if you're less familiar with and want to come to grips with how there can be relativism even about things like logic, this video can help quite a bit to explain how, in fact, one actually can be a relativist when it comes to logic, 
that there are different kinds of logic and what actual philosophers and logicians and maybe computer scientists I guess mean when we say logic. In any case, O'Grady allows relativism both here and here. But here, it is limited by rationality, where he will argue against relativization. So like I said, at first I was just gonna skip these chapters, but then I realized that one might not really appreciate what he's gonna be doing in that final battle of his without knowledge of some of what happens here, because he actually does reference it and in part his strategy is to accommodate the relativists away from here into one of these other areas. So I decided to try and make a quick short video about both of these chapters to some degree. Not my normal in-depth line-by-line citation and standard of production, you know? Maybe lower quality audio or less visuals, I don't know. So I did one on ontology already, which for our sake is pretty much a discussion about the world and how the world can be relative. And for that video, I just made it very general, about the general battles going on in that field and how O'Grady kind of presents it, but not cited perfectly down to the line and not going over everything O'Grady says, just finally saying where O'Grady lands on the issue. Like I don't want it to be overly visually produced or anything, just wanted it to be quick. But it seems like I may have let it go a little bit out of hand there, <laughs> it got mad visual. So for this video, actually this is my second time doing it. The first time doing it, I went super fast and super quick just sticking to line by line citation of everything that happened. But it seemed like it was too fast. So I'm gonna slow it down. Technically I already did the work. I've already made a lot of the visualizations, although it's still not up to par to my normal standard and maybe the explanations is not even as in depth or as perfect an explanation as I normally would do. So this video isn't my norm kind of video, keep that in mind. I want it to be at least kind of understandable what's basically going on in epistemology at least in terms of what's happening with relativism and what O'Grady's final position is. So let's get through this chapter together and if you don't care for this chapter you can just jump to that final battle if that's all you really wanted to but you know, here we are in epistemology and if you're interested in epistemology this video can definitely maybe help in some kind of more general sense, I don't know. But let's begin. So he presents two main positions that believe yes, you can have relativism in knowledge, but not be a skeptic. A stronger position and a weaker position. The stronger position believes that different cultures and historical epochs have different standards for assessing knowledge and thus different sets of beliefs. There's no shared point from which to judge, implying they are completely cut off from each other, which is a problem of incommensurability. No shared point to measure. Judgment isn't possible from the outside, one can only judge from within its own standards, each epoch judges itself. One problem for philosophers who hold this position is that in their own practice they seem to be making claims that transcend particular cultures, so it's taken as self-defeating. One way to say this is that they want to deny that there's necessarily anything shared among all of them, that one cannot judge among them, but in doing so they are speaking about all of them in some general sense as if that is something that they all have in common, and so they are judging them to be in such a way in this general sense, so they're doing what they claim shouldn't be possible. And don't mind my commentary if it doesn't help, but this is basically self-defeat and it is a massive running theme when it comes to facing this kind of opponent. So they need to be able to show that they can hold this position without being self-defeating. Both Richard Rorty and Stephen Stitch try to do this, and both of these figures will come back again in the Battle on Rationality, Chapter 5. Now a weaker version of this does admit relativization can happen even in things like logic and math and geometry or knowledge based on the a priori. And they're supported with real world examples, like the change from Euclidean geometry, Aristotelian logic, Newtonian physics, which all used to be taken as absolute, non-relative stuff. But with developments in the 19th and 20th century, it's pretty clear we can have alternative geometry, different kinds of logical and mathematical calculi even, and even new physics. And in terms of that logic part, again if you would like examples of different logics and how that could work, please check out my video covering his discussion about alternative logic. But while this position is open to relativization about even those things, there is still a limited amount of alternatives, not an infinite variety of alternatives about those things. And also it's still a limited form of relativism in terms of using one or an alternative system, that there's still a universal way of judging among them. So both of these are epistemological relativism, 
One is stronger, which he calls radical epistemological relativism, where all judgments are relative to cultural and historical epochs, no universal standard at all, all beliefs thus relativized to those separate and incommensurable epochs. And the weaker, or as it is called by O'Grady, the moderate epistemological relativist, still holds that a priori judgments are indeed relative to different systems, so there can be alternative accounts of the a priori knowledge, knowledge like math or logic, things that we can have based on pure reasoning without even any experience. But on the other hand, there's still one universal way of judging all those alternative systems. And before making the case for this latter position, which Paul O'Grady holds, he first wants to discuss the difference between relativism and skepticism and kind of trace how relativism kind of came out as a way of responding to skepticism. And hey, in epistemology, talking about skepticism is a pretty good place to start. But after we're done talking about skepticism and the responses to it, then we'll talk about the main two big battles in modern epistemological warfare, which is foundationalism versus coherentism and externalism versus internalism. After he's done discussing both of these things, then we'll go back to his discussion of the radical versus the moderate epistemological relativists, and why he prefers the latter. So first, skepticism. Well, to be clear, the skeptic definitely thinks that if they're all alternatives to what we think to be true, then we don't really have knowledge and should just suspend our belief. But the epistemological relativists hold that you can have alternatives, but having alternatives doesn't necessarily mean that we don't know, and that those alternatives can also actually constitute knowledge. Now there's been many skeptical positions in history, for example the ancients thought that being skeptical was a kind of ethical position against holding belief solely on dogma, based just in faith, which may have been used in religious and political or social oppression of the people. Other philosophers use it as a tool to test our knowledge, to see what we can even be skeptical about. If we can be doubtful about it, it meant that we didn't really know it. So philosophers kind of tried to use doubt to uproot things that we didn't know to see what we have left, things that were indubitable, things that couldn't be doubted, and try to build our knowledge based on those undoubtable, indubitable things. Now some philosophers are doubtful about having any knowledge at all, while others are doubtful about some specific things, like the external world, or that other minds exist, or the possibility of moral knowledge, or even that there could be knowledge based on pure thought, pure reasoning alone, not having any experience or anything, like I said, what's considered a priori knowledge. Now for this next section, we're just going to take this one as our main example of the skeptic. So just so you have an idea of why somebody would be skeptical about the external world, I'm going to give you kind of a more modern example for this, a more modern thought experiment, that of the possibility of having been born completely within a computer simulated environment for example. Nothing about how things appear to you within this simulated environment may connect to how things really are in the actual world. In such a situation, all of your sensations are merely a part of the simulation. In fact, even your body would be a part of the simulation. Maybe in the real world you don't actually have two legs and arms. As if perhaps you're just a brain with electrodes being plugged in and just being given sensations of sights and sounds and smells. I mean, technically in that situation, you wouldn't really know if there really are trees or birds if they really exist in that external world. But also, since all of our science or information we were told that science has is based on that simulation, we wouldn't even know if we are brains. And in this way, it seems always possible to be doubtful about the external world. But that's just a thought experiment, don't worry about it too much. The point is that you can be skeptical about the external world. And so O'Grady outlines two strategies to respond to this kind of skepticism. One that is to meet the challenge of the skeptic, to actually find beliefs that can't be doubted even in this kind of situation, and then build our knowledge off of those as a kind of secure base. And the other one is to show that the skeptical challenge is not something to be taken seriously at all. It's kind of more of a rejection strategy to deny the skepticism. Now most philosophic tradition is about that first strategy, so if you're just starting philosophy, you're probably going to learn one of these two things if not both. I mean you should probably learn about both. But as he presents them, there's the empiricist and the rationalist take on this kind of strategy. For the empirical strategy, the idea is that beliefs immediately deprived from perception, often called the given, were proposed as many as immune to doubt. So if you think of it, simulation or not, the given may be that I'm having the sensation of red right now. That's still true no matter what. 
not conceptualizing what that red is about or what it's coming from or if it connects to anything beyond what I perceive, nothing like that. It's supposed to be non-conceptualized experience. That's still something I know directly no matter what situation it is. But hey, that's just my example of what the given might be. Really the details of what the given is varied a lot among philosophers, but they did have all in common the idea that knowledge began with the data of the senses. That's what makes it empirical. These immediately derived perceptions, the given, were taken to be safe from skepticism, and so we can build our secure knowledge strictly off those things. Now that approach may seem promising to you, but the problem that led most to reject this kind of move was the issue of giving an account of how that stuff can even have data that we aren't skeptical about. The whole point was that it was so basic it were below the level of conceptualization. But once you conceptualize it in order to build off it, it no longer is safe from skepticism. And we kind of already spoke about this issue a lot in that ontology video, so if you're interested in what's going on here, how is this an accurate criticism, please go check out that video first, or maybe even the power of relativism, the first chapter, to see what's being said here. That the idea that we can just build off simply how we see things is actually a kind of naive position at this point. We've moved way past that. Anyway, for this reason, O'Grady says the empiricist's attempt at meeting the skeptical challenge has failed. Now, on the rationalist attempt to meet this challenge is most notably René Descartes, who actually thought there were some kind of special properties of certain beliefs that made them indubitable, that made them the kind of beliefs that can't ever be doubted, namely that they must be clear and distinct. But when pressed to explain these properties, how they allow them to justify other propositions and why they would entail certainty, as O'Grady remarks, that did not prove compelling. So both of these failed. What about strategy two? In terms of kind of denying or rejecting the kind of philosophic doubts that we have here about the external world, O'Grady covers two philosophers, namely Wittgenstein and Quine. Now I already have done a video on Wittgenstein and if you want a little better understanding if you're unfamiliar with his latter philosophy, uh, please do check it out. It's even less, I guess, formal than this video. It's more of me kind of talking from the top of my head to kind of compensate for a section where he talked about Wittgenstein earlier in one of his chapters that I just didn't think was really great. Nevertheless, I think in my opinion it's a pretty good video of giving an understanding of Wittgenstein and how he deals with this kind of skepticism and how he would deal with this kind of skepticism as being ungrounded and also how Wittgenstein's philosophy loans itself to being used by relativists even though he didn't want that. But O'Grady comments that even if we do take Wittgenstein's approach to show that these doubts are ungrounded, it changes our conception of philosophy, to see it more as therapeutic and as removing kind of system building. But also he remarks how some philosophers still take some initial lessons from Wittgenstein to do away with the skepticism, but still feel they can go on and continue doing philosophy in a more traditional systemic fashion. And it seems to me, that this includes using Wittgenstein's philosophy about how there being different language games and therefore different standards within each language game to then be relativistic about almost anything. And this even includes rationality, but O'Grady will address that rationality thing in chapter 5 like we've already mentioned. Now O'Grady kind of makes a sort of similar point about Quine then too, which I also made a kind of quick rough video as a starting point about Quine also which I hope is done by now, but he really does speak about Quine in both of these middle chapters and I really didn't want to have to present O'Grady's version of Quine twice. So I just made that video so I can reference it in both of these videos. Uh, so you can check that out. And it will explain its relation both to ontology and its relation to epistemology. And so here also in regards to skepticism. It will explain how he finds that doubts arising from scientific knowledge can also be answered therefore with scientific knowledge, from where it arises, rather than taking those doubts to some extreme unanswerable level. Like I said though, I think O'Grady is making a similar point about Quine as he did Wittgenstein, that even though he accounts for how different they are, he says that Wittgenstein's philosophy led to a change in conception of philosophy as more of a form of therapy to remove a kind of attempt to build a transcendental philosophical structure. And even for Quine, his philosophy changes the conception of philosophy since it's no longer seen as different from science, it's no longer seen as separate, they are both simply a part of the same web. 
But also, like Wittgenstein, there are philosophers that could actually take Quine's position but don't go on to hold science as particularly prized by a belief that Quine did, which was a non-relativist epistemology. And so they use Quine's philosophy to deal with the skepticism but then go on to become epistemological relativists, drawing a parallel to Wittgenstein, how his philosophy is used too to be relativistic about epistemology. In summary for this section about skepticism in terms of our epistemological discussion, it shows that the more promising solutions to skepticism, what we are calling strategy 2, which is the rejection of the skeptical challenge, they actually can be used to lead to epistemological relativism, but also it requires a change in our conception of philosophy. And we'll talk more about that later. But that's the point here, about this traditional problem about skepticism in epistemology, has in more recent time with more recent and modern strategy led to some taking on epistemological relativist positions. But now let's move on to the main two big battles in modern epistemological warfare, which is foundationalism versus coherentism and externalism versus internalism. Now these two former things were taken to be absolute and these two latter things were taken to be more relativistic. But in this section, Paul O'Grady is going to show that this isn't necessarily so that actually all of these positions can have both elements of relativism and elements of an absolutist position. That even the foundationalist and the externalist can be made relativistic and that both the coherentist and internalist positions don't have to lead to any kind of extreme radical relativism. That there can be some kind of absolutist constraints on them too. So before we get into these main two big battles, I just want to explain something called inferential justification first. And for those of us who are not familiar with formal logic, let me just kind of loosely explain the idea using an example of basic arithmetic, basic math. So look at this example, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Now the justification of 4 is actually inferred from these earlier premises. And so in this way, the truth of these is being preserved into the conclusion of 4. Now it's kind of weird to talk about math like this for me, so in a more formal logical symbolic language, basically the truth of these premises are preserved in the conclusion. That if p then q, and we have p, we use something called modus ponens to infer q. The truth of q is inferentially justified given that these former premises are true. If it's true that if p then q, and if it's true that p, we can therefore infer and justify Q. So justification in this sense is kind of moving from these earlier premises to this latter one. Keep that in mind. In this way it's usually taken that belief is justified and so inferentially from another belief. And justification is just thereafter passed on. So anyway, let's look firstly at foundationalism. Now we have already in some sense kind of spoken about this earlier with the empirical strategy, but anyway. The foundationalist idea is that all of our beliefs justification just don't go back forever and ever, though there is some battle about this idea of going back forever, which actually goes past the time of O'Grady's book between Klein and Gannett, or Jeanette? Once again, I don't really have friends to tell me how to say things. So subscribe! Either way, both positions here take the idea of it going back forever as obviously untenable. Anyway, also for the foundationalist, for them it doesn't just cycle back onto itself. Instead, there must be some basic original first beliefs that aren't inferentially justified from other beliefs. That these basic beliefs are special and in some way self-justifying. And higher level premises are just built upon them in a process called epistemic ascent. So maybe as a kind of quick simple image we might imagine an upside down triangle. So this kind of seems to imply for most foundationalists then that knowledge can only be one structure as based on these basic beliefs. There is no room for relativism of our beliefs then. But O'Grady shows with Carnap that even these basic beliefs, or so called basic ones, can actually be characterized in different ways as relative to our theoretical models. The theories that we have actually shape how we interpret what those basic beliefs even are. And we can choose different models for our different aims, different purposes. But in so doing so, changing our theories, we even end up changing those so called basic beliefs. In ways that show that they can't actually be taken as pre-theoretical I guess. 
we can't actually take them as just prime and evident in of themselves. But also with Carnap, the whole epistemic ascent itself can actually be relative and different based on which model we are using. And to make that sort of idea clear, once again, I do have a video on logic that makes this kind of idea more clear about how we can have different logics and different models and how that can entail different inferential rules that allow us to build in different ways. One of these models isn't inherently more right or wrong. We can in fact just select them based on our purposes. And for Carnap, those purposes were used for scientists. Anyway, so please do go check out that video, okay? The point here anyway was that relativism can still arise when it comes to foundationalism too, even though it's normally thought of as being strictly absolutist. Now the coherentist position, which is the opposition to foundationalism, is much more like a larger web. For them, they believe there are no basic beliefs. There can be no beliefs that aren't justified by other beliefs. And to combat the foundationalists that accuse them of just being circular in their reasoning, well, they say that justification is non-linear, that justification is more holistic, justification coming from multiple beliefs within the matrix of beliefs. Now, O'Grady summons one of the most popular images that kind of give visualization to the coherentist picture, which is the image of Neruth's boat. An image that I'm kind of presenting here in a kind of more simple fashion, but hey, I think the point comes across. The idea is that no one plank in this boat is essential. You can actually remove any one if needed and replace any plank at any one time, but not the whole thing, which means there's no foundational essential plank. When we remove any one plank, we can make other adjustments in other places to make sure we still stay afloat while we're replacing it, for example. And just a note, this whole idea of Neruth's boat is actually kind of in part based on the ship of Theseus. In the ship of Theseus, you can replace one plank at a time all the way through the ship so that it ends up being completely different. And when it comes to the ship of Theseus, the question is, is it still the same ship if it's completely different by the end? But there's no clear point at which we count it as being suddenly a new ship. Anyway, this discussion is not about the ship of Theseus but just the idea that in fact the entire thing can change because there is no one essential, foundational, or most important belief or thing that we know a part of our entire ship. Anyway, so the big deal with coherentism in terms of relativism is that it seems that we can have an endless number of different systems that even contradict with each other since all it needs to be justified is be coherent within its own system. And hey, if you think of it, many people suffering from extreme paranoid schizophrenia have large structures of beliefs that they are completely obsessed about trying to make perfectly coherent. Or take conspiracy theorists, for example. They might have huge numbers of beliefs that they think interlock and connect in so many different ways that they are completely obsessed about making perfectly connect and, and internally coherent too. But what they believe still contradicts what we believe in some ways or many ways even. But if we take every system as being equally justified, then this is taken to be radical relativism. And to deal with this kind of situation of how there can be seemingly contradictory different coherentist belief, uh, in my phrasing at least I'll say it, that some actually believe, well, you know, you just take these web of beliefs and you mash them together to make one big one. One big web of belief that's for everyone. And some take that to be what's happening with the whole project of unifying science. That's one way to deal with that kind of problem. Others try to mark out some systems as unique or special by appealing to some kind of transcendental arguments about the nature of belief. How some beliefs are specially known in some way. Or sort of fusing elements of both foundationalism and coherentism together. Anyway, because of those, it seems to imply that it's possible that there can be one correct system. That even in coherentism, there can be an absolutist and a non-relativist picture. But if there can be many different systems, one falls into extreme relativism. And the moderate position is that while there can be different systems, there's a limitation on how many alternatives there can be. Again, the stronger position is that there can be many globally different systems, systems that are completely different from each other. And the weaker position is the idea that there's actually just distinct local subgroups within a larger system. The radical epistemological relativist uses a coherentist picture but with multiple systems and no limits on how many there can be. The moderate epistemological relativist 
is one where there can be local subgroups within a more global system. So to be clear, relativism can happen both with foundationalism and coherentism. But later, when we talk about both of these positions, they're both going to be using a more coherentist structure. Just a matter of whether or not it's radically relativistic or moderately so. But onward to the next big battle in epistemology, externalism versus internalism. Now most of the epistemological tradition has been internalist till recently. Now traditionally in the philosophic tradition we used to define knowledge as being justified true belief. That you had a belief, you had good reasons for believing what you do, and it is actually true. Then we would say you have knowledge. But then this guy named Edmund Gettier came along and basically showed that we can make cases where somebody does have good reasons to believe what they do and it happens to turn out to be true but we still wouldn't say they really knew. So it showed that JTB wasn't enough, that there probably had to be something more, or maybe even that this whole enterprise of defining knowledge in this way is not a good one, but that's my personal opinion. But don't worry about what that special case was or what to do instead. The whole point here is that we still held that knowledge generally had to have an entailed truth, but that somebody could be justified in believing something even though it didn't have to be true. That it was possible to be fully justified and have the good reasons to believe something even though it turns out to be false. And in such a case we would say you don't have knowledge. So this question about internalism and externalism isn't about knowledge itself, it's specifically about justification. And the internalists hold that the reasons why somebody should be considered justified in believing what they do should be available to the person who holds the justified belief. It should be internally available to them. But the externalist says that one can be justified for believing what they do for reasons outside of what is consciously known or available to the person who has those true beliefs. The externalist feels we can actually point to certain mechanisms that might be outside of what we are aware of that still nevertheless produce likely true beliefs in us. And because those mechanisms still produce true beliefs in us, that means we should still be considered justified if we used those mechanisms, even if we're not aware of what those mechanisms are or articulate how we got beliefs from those mechanisms, such as perception, like seeing. Maybe seeing and perception actually produces very likely beliefs in us, so we're still justified in believing what we do because we use that mechanism, even if we can't exactly explain why we believe what we do based on them. Now it's important to note, in this way externalists kind of have connected justification to truth. And this is a connection that the internalist doesn't necessitate at all. And so because of that, it might seem like since the externalist is connected to truth, and since we've seen that truth is not relative, that's an earlier battle that Paul O'Grady had, we would say that then there's no room for relativism and externalism, because truth isn't relative, and they're supposed to be connected, right? Well, O'Grady shows with Alvin Goldman's reliableist account that this isn't necessarily so. That there can be different frameworks that provide systems of rules for judging if a belief is justified or not, called J-rules. And these rules don't even have to be consciously known, but can be applied from without to give an objective judgment if a belief is justified. But there's a criterion of rightness for when it comes to judging which framework succeeds in capturing justification. So the criterion establishes the correct framework, which establishes if something is justified. And according to Goldman, epistemic terms like justified or not happens within these frameworks, but outside of them there's just descriptive language, so on the level of the criterion he settles for the term of reliability. And technically there could be different frameworks that meet the same criterion. To be clear, Goldman doesn't say that these are culturally relative or anything like that, but they can be multiple within even an individual. If that seems unclear, don't worry about it. The point here for this video is that even the externalist has some room for relativism. But even in comparison to that, the internalists seem much more obviously open to relativism as it appears there's no external constraint of their beliefs having to be true. Consider in one person's perspective, they could have all the good reasons to believe they know something, 
And he gives an example of himself possibly believing that a lecture will happen from an eminent philosopher because he's seen the ad posters for it and students have spoken to him about it and he even sees someone being guided into the lecture hall. So he has many factors, perception, testimony, coherence, and they all come together to make him perfectly justified in believing a lecture is happening or going to happen. But it turns out it's actually all an elaborate hoax set up by some students playing a trick on him. In this context, he was perfectly justified in believing there was a lecture happening. But in the context of the students who may have set up the hoax, they were completely justified in believing there was no lecture happening. So we had two valid justifications but opposing beliefs. So this led philosophers to think that maybe context matters for justification. Context in terms of who's the one describing something as being justified or not. So instead of saying that S is justified in believing P, we now have that S is justified in believing P relative to context C. But what kind of context can we have? Well, O'Grady says that contextualism has been investigating this kind of issue. So the point is that internalism kind of leads us into a discussion about contextualism. Differing knowledge standards apply in different contexts. For example, Mary knows her kids are in the yard because she just checked on them and she has no reason to think otherwise. So we might agree that yeah, Mary knows her kids are in the yard, she just checked. But also, we find out there's actually a kidnapper in the neighborhood. So now we think, oh, well, considering that, maybe she's not justified in knowing. Maybe she doesn't really know. Mary uses her own standards in her context to be able to say that she is fully justified to believe she knows where her kids are. But we use our standards, given what we know, to say that she's not justified. Now what makes us select different standards? Uh, Mark Heller says it depends on our interests and the demands of the conversation we're having. But don't worry about where this goes. O'Grady tries tying this all up by saying that even if knowledge descriptions are contextually sensitive, that doesn't necessarily lead to extreme relativism. Because relative to a context within those standards, there's still an objective answer to whether or not S knows P. Just like indexical sentences that use I or this. For example saying yeah, I am in Paris. Sure, the truth of that is relative to who's saying it. But once we know who's saying it, there's still a way of objectively evaluating if it's true. Meaning given the context, once we figure out what the context is, one can establish an absolute truth claim. But that's not the only contextualist argument that prevents a strong relativist reading of it. It still seems open and possible that there could be general epistemic standards that govern more local contextualized aspects. And that's actually kind of what he will argue for and give details of in his chapter 5. But as a summary of this whole section of both these battles, basically despite what's normally assumed of all of these positions, they can both have elements of relativism and absolutism to some degree. And even if we take these normally assumed relativist positions, they don't necessarily have to lead to radical relativism then. We can have actually more moderate versions of relativism with them. So now we're going to deal with that conflict of radical epistemological relativist versus a modern epistem versus a moderate epistemological relativist position. For the radical epistemological relativists, he gives the examples of Rorty and Stitch. And I'm just going to be like fully fully honest with you right now, uh, I detest having to get into this mess. Getting into it here will be overly complicated and cumbersome. And ultimately, I don't think it's uh, very contributive to what we want to do with O'Grady anyway. Even if Rorty's challenges may be one that's more likely going to be coming from someone who we describe as a relativist, arguments that are going to be made against anyone trying to attempt to establish anything universal in any which way, Still, a lot of the descriptions about the failings of philosophy and the presumptions of objectivity and the denial of trying to assume a kind of transcendent structure and all that, you know, which isn't an inaccurate criticism of the old philosophical tradition, but it actually results in a kind of unnecessary wholesale rejection of the role of philosophy itself.
But you know what, let me actually read the sort of conclusion Paul O'Grady has when it comes to Rorty and Stitch, so we can get a kind of sense of the criticism O'Grady has for both of them, and also the kind of role that is still left for philosophy, even considering the accurate critiques that Rorty and Stitch might have. So first he says of Rorty. Rorty's view is just too extreme. Because one model of ontology, truth, rationality, epistemology and so on fails, does not mean the whole philosophical enterprise fails. A fallible historically, politically and scientifically attuned reflection on questions of meaning, truth, reason and so on is philosophy and is what people like Habermas, McDowell, Putnam and Quine, to mention just a few, are doing. One may disagree with them, indeed being part of the philosopher's club seems to entail disagreeing, but it reflects too much of an all or nothing style of thinking to reject epistemology and metaphysics because certain versions of it haven't worked, and instead plump for social political analyses of truth, rationality, warrant, and so on. As Searle once remarked apropos Wittgenstein, just because his early theories of philosophy failed, he concluded that all philosophy was doomed to fail. In some forms of anti-philosophy, one can find enormous philosophical hubris lurking just beneath the surface. Rorty has done a great service in his criticism of the analytic tradition, forcing it to be more self-aware. However, self-criticism doesn't always mean self-annihilation, as Rorty seems to think in this case. I mean, I find these to be some pretty harsh words for Rorty, but also I very much like this quote because I think it's far more accurate to how and what philosophy is compared to the results of Rorty's conception. But anyway, let's look at what Paul O'Grady says in response to both of them together now. What is common to both Stitch and Rorty is a tendency to set up dichotomies as if they were mutually exclusive and jointly exhaustive of the options. Rorty rejects the traditional conception of philosophy as seeking to find objectivity in the transcendent and non-human. Stitch rejects more recent attempts to do the same in the scientific world. Both have quite compelling cases to make against their opponents. However, they then both leap to a position that this is supposed to be the only alternative to the rejected position. Rorty speaks of intersubjective agreement as the new objectivity and Stitch talks of achieving diverse cognitive goals. The implication in both cases is that while these are meaningful locutions, it is a retreat to the rejected conception of philosophy to seek further explanation as to why certain goals and methods are preferable to others, and for what reasons communities come to agreement over issues. In fact, both are largely right in their rejection of traditional ways of explaining objectivity and cognitive success, but fall foul of explaining how objectivity emerges in the new conversational context, other than saying it generally does. An important task for philosophers who are persuaded of the failure of some of these traditional projects, but who are dissatisfied by the skimpiness of explanation of how objectivity as intersubjectivity is supposed to work is to try and establish how it does. A beginning for such a project is to look at a priori knowledge. So that's what O'Grady does next. Oh uh, man, this video is huge. Okay, so I'm gonna hit this last part of the video with some mad crunch time and I'm kinda sorry for that, but don't worry, I will still explain what O'Grady's position is gonna be in terms of epistemological relativism at the end. But this is the section then devoted to moderate epistemological relativism, and pretty much first he's going to explain why we can be relativist about even these things like logic and math and geometry, but then after explaining that he's going to explain why we should still have it be moderate, why there's still some use in there being relative, but also at the same time why we don't have to result in some kind of extreme relativism, what the limits of this relativism is. So anyway, let's talk about it. So he's starting this discussion with a priori knowledge. So basically, a priori knowledge was taken to be the best example of absolute knowledge prior to experience, and it was also thought to be necessarily true. But Kripke challenged this and shown that uh, that relationship isn't actually always holding, that it doesn't have to be necessary. 
In any case, like I said, keep in mind the standard candidates for what a priori knowledge is, is things like logic or math or so-called special sentences, but I don't want to have to explain what those special sentences are right now. The point is some believe that they can have justification for all of these things based in a kind of rational intuition. And these philosophers are namely Russell and Bonjour. But they thought these things were known immediately, that they were kind of special to human intuition and they were non-reducible, they couldn't be reduced to other beliefs, and they weren't arbitrary, and also that they were kind of part of the mind-independent world, they weren't just true inside our heads. Now at first these things were taken to be infallible, that they can't be wrong, but that changed, especially when whole systems that were taken to be a priori were challenged and shown that there were alternatives to them, particularly when it was shown that there could be non-Euclidean geometry. Now if you want to look up what non-Euclidean geometry is, you can do that yourself. It's pretty much the challenge to Euclid's fourth postulate. But more or less as a kind of rudimentary explanation, the old geometry had pretty much assumed a flat 2D surface. But non-Euclidean geometry can be done in 3D, in three dimensions. And it's not always based on the idea that the 2D one was wrong, just that the two-dimensional Euclidean geometry was perfectly fine for cases where we were doing work on 2D surfaces. So conventionalism is a position that is meant to deal with there being multiple a priori systems and we just kind of select one. And in fact we have already seen something like this in that logic video with Carnap and how we actually make different systems as useful for scientists different logical systems, but that did mean for Carnap that there were still practical constraints. Namely, is that system actually useful for the scientists or not? So it wasn't completely relativistic. There were other problems though for the conventionalist, and some of those problems were pointed out by Quine. You see, Quine wanted to defend a logic as being particularly deep in the mind, and he showed that the idea of consequence as used by the conventionalist is actually a part of that logic. And so we kind of have a funny result, that in conventionalism we may have it say that whenever there was a case type T, we apply convention C. And so we have case T, then using modus ponens, kind of like we did earlier in the video, we can conclude to using convention C. That seems kind of clear, right? But the funny thing is, what if the convention is modus ponens? Then we're using modus ponens to employ modus ponens. <laughs> That's kind of like a funny cool move Quine did. So it seems at the upper level there's still some principles of logic which go outside the bounds of conventionalism and certainly this is O'Grady's kind of point in that logic chapter too that he was trying to argue for. But what's happening at this upper apparatus he's going to argue for again at chapter 5. Hint hint it's rationality. <laughs> It's basically the system that's coming up all the time. That's what that's what he's going to talk about. Anyway, anyway, Quine's system actually does away with the a priori completely then. And again, you can check out this video if you'd like an account of how that's happening. But O'Grady points out problems with Quine as well, because it denies a meaning-belief distinction. And meanings, for even terms where we don't even have experiences of them yet, still seem to be important for philosophers even if they're just temporarily set to see what their implications are. Meanings can change, but all the more useful to clarify what those meanings we set out are going to be. So O'Grady then presents what he calls a pragmatist a priori position. Where instead of completely denying a priori beliefs, we actually do have or can make a priori frameworks. And they are distinct from what we can call a posteriori beliefs if we want, which is the content within and of which that require this framework as a precondition for talking about the world. And he shows this distinction of what's the framework and what is the content within the framework actually being used by many different philosophers who are widely different in their philosophies, such as Lewis, Carnap, and Wittgenstein. And in a way, appeasing all the changes that happened through this entire lineage, he says that this framework can change, that it's not infallible. But investigating these frameworks is central to philosophy. There's no commitment to a single framework for all contexts. There can be different ones. And even some things within a framework can eventually become a part of it. But we have three questions for philosophers to investigate. 1. Making sense of the notion of a framework itself. Is it or how much of it is explicit or implicit, natural or artificial? 
Two, is there a core framework that is universal? And three, how do we judge among those frameworks themselves? How does one judge a framework? So O'Grady gives his answers to these three questions. For that first question, making sense of the notion of a framework itself, he says these frameworks are a tacit set of presupposition, and that the job for philosophers is to be able to address and judge them, not just what their purposes serve, but the different kind of purposes we can even have for them. Doing this philosophers don't merely just point them out that we do have such frameworks and such preconceptions that are in play, but then after pointing them out we can actually tinker with them and make adjustments to them, perhaps even make new ones or improve on them for different purposes. So I really enjoy O'Grady's input here because in the end of this chapter he's making a good case for philosophy itself and the kind of work it can do in a way that isn't within the specter of Rorty's criticism or those who think that all philosophy is somehow necessarily tied to a kind of universal transcendent objective structure building in order to correspond with mind independent reality. And it also creates a new conception of the role of philosophy in a way that connects to the lessons learned from Wittgenstein and Quine. But he also then goes on to promise that in terms of this second question, if there is a universal framework, he will claim that there is a universal framework always in play, or rather that, and I prefer rather here, that what frameworks are can't be wholly different from each other. That there is something shared among all of them, and he will call that the core rationality, which actually has his principle of non-contradiction. And actually with that core rationality, we will be able to do three, judge among them. So he will cover that core rationality in his next chapter. And that's it for what O'Grady says in epistemology. So there is relativism in a knowledge, relative to a framework. And even those frameworks can change and be different relative to different purposes. But as we shall see with O'Grady in the next chapter, he will argue against it being extreme relativism because there's a limit on what these frameworks can even be. And what exactly that limit is, is shown in his next chapter. That's the video. So if you liked this video and you appreciate kind of what I've done here, please really do support me. Also, if you do really want the super fast version of this video, uh, join my Patreon. In any case, if you enjoyed this video or thought this was actually helpful in any way or form, please consider joining me for the next video or check out some of my other stuff. And always remember, no matter how great you feel your thought and argument is, no matter how great you think a philosopher's thought and arguments are, there is no end to philosophy. Philosophers keep battling.